Welcome back to FuryCast. But first, make sure to like this video, subscribe, and of course, smash the bell for notifications. And don't forget to sign up to the mailing list for my new graphic novel, illustrated by the world famous Ebi Canales. Sign up now. The link is in the description. On today's show, I have an award-winning filmmaker. He's also my brother in the art of jujitsu. He just released his most recent film, Mystery Spot, currently available on multiple streaming platforms via Terror Films. We're gonna talk about a bunch of things and go down a Gen X wormhole. Today on FuryCast, I have my good friend, Mr. Mel House. So yeah, Mel, take me back to your childhood, how you grew up, and uh, tell me how you eventually ended up being a successful filmmaker. I uh, born and raised in Houston, uh, spent most of my life here, minus a few years in Austin to for college. But uh, I grew up in mo more or less grew up in the Heights area, spent most of my childhood there. Actually, I. Uh, my parents at the time, when I was real young, they they still live in Fourth Ward, which doesn't exist anymore, but it was like the ghetto. And so they sent me to live with my aunt or my great aunt who lived in the Heights area. And I spent most of my childhood there because it, was, it gave me access to better schools and things like that. It's where I met a lot of my lifelong, lifelong friends, but also a lot of, most importantly, a lot of teachers that really sort of saw the creativity within me and, uh, you know, encouraged it when I was in school. You know, when I was in elementary school, it wasn't I went to Oak Forest Elementary and it wasn't uh, out of the ordinary to see us third, fourth, fifth graders walking around with like Stephen King books. You know, that's what we love to read comic books, too. But those books were, you know, literally and figuratively huge at the time. And a lot of us just started getting into that. And uh, that's kind of what really <clears throat> that's, I guess, where the storytelling fire got lit. That and like reading X Men comics, like Chris Claremont stuff. I got, I really got into like the long game storytelling and things like that, which is very similar to the way Stephen King sort of writes novels. And um, I think that's what lit the writing fire in me. And then as I got older, going through those same schools with those same people, when it, I had this, this was in the 80s. So it wasn't like now where video equipment is very readily accessible or you have a, you can make a film on your phone. Uh, Why are you pointing at me when you say make a film on your phone? See, he pointed at I'm me. Like, like, yeah, no, I'm, pointing, I'm pointing at my, <laughs> I wasn't, I wasn't trying. Make one of those cheap do. movies like Derek Fury. No, no, I've done it too, man. It's funny because there's a lot of shots in mystery spot I shot on my iPhone. I don't tell anybody. I just want to see if they'll be able to figure it out. But, um, you know, it was rarer at the time to have know somebody that had a video camera. And even, even if they did, then you'd have to, as far as editing goes, you'd have to edit in camera or know somebody with two VCRs. You could, you know, edit that way. But I, I did have a friend named Nicholas Sanchez, who still follows me. Shout out, Nick. Um, he had a video camera in middle school. Whenever we had to do a book report type thing, uh, Nick and I were able to convince our teachers uh, to turn in a video project instead of like a written project. So we'd always do these video narrative type things. Uh, I'd usually go over to his house and we'd script it out. We'd even storyboard it kind of and shoot it in order and present that to the class. And so that's, I think that's really where I was like, huh, this is pretty fun. You know, maybe I'd be into doing this. And of course, you know, growing up watching movies on VHS and things like that and really being into horror stuff and genre stuff. That's kind of, that's kind of where the fire got lit. Like when I saw Nightmare on Elm Street, I quickly realized, oh man, this is kind of like a big magic trick. You know, like making all this stuff happen. I want to learn how to do that. So that's that's kind of when it all started. When I was, you know, eight, nine, ten years old. I know you well. I mean, you know, and I didn't know a lot of this because it's pretty much the same thing. Like, you know, find my story is almost identical, which is finding a friend who had a video camera, and then right. going to another friend's house who had the dual VCRs, and your you're dubbing back, cutting back and forth on the right. on the VCRs, convincing convincing teachers to allow me to turn in a video project instead of writing a written right. project, all that stuff, right? So, and of course, the Chris Claremont era of mm. X Men, and and then you know, you jump into Liefeld and and McFarlane and and the whole image boom and and things of that. Um, so, but you're saying all this happened when you were nine, by the time you were nine, you'd done all this. Cause this was probably the time I was 18. So you're a little 
Yeah, well, well I guess quicker than me. Yeah, I mean, I feel like the stuff with Nick, like the really getting into the video stuff, that was middle school, so I was probably 12, 13. But it, you know, between nine and thirteen, definitely, I was eight when I saw Nightmare on Elm Street. So that's probably like when the first fire got lit, and then all that Stephen King stuff. You know, I started just devouring the books, starting from the top, and then catching myself up. And then by the time I would finish one, another one would come out because this is like when it's you know, in his coke fueled heyday, we were just pumping them out. <laughs> you know what I mean? One, a, one a year, maybe two a year. And so I would, uh, I, I, you know, I was reading, you know, voraciously reading all that stuff. And that's when I really started getting creative. Like we would have journal, we'd have journal time at school. And I think it was intended uh, by the teacher for us to be like self-reflective kind of stuff. But I would write like narrative fiction. And I, I, you know, I would do like Nightmare on Elm Street fan fiction or like Ghostbusters fanfic, you know. And I remember the teachers, the teacher at the time. At first, she kind of roll her eyes at it, but then she started getting into it, you know, and started encouraging it even. So, yeah, it was all around that time. And by the time I got into middle school, that was really when I was almost searching out ways to make this stuff happen. Because again, you know, you couldn't edit on your computer. You couldn't uh, just pull something out of your pocket and shoot a movie. You really had to look for, you know, look for opportunities to make that stuff happen. That was probably the early 90s for you. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. Late 80s, early 90s was in, when I was in middle school. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. And so your high school life, what was that like? I imagine you would like long hair that kind of like dangled over your your eyes. Real yeah. Solid, I, like yeah, a character I had, from I had a multicolored, I had, yeah, I had colored dreadlocks. Um, And when I started, when I started high school, it was, it was kind of like I was trying to thread the needle of both. Like I still wanted to be a creative weirdo and let that flag fly. But also, you know, I was by my family, I was getting pretty pushed pretty hard to like play football because my older half brothers all did. They went to school and football, football scholarships and things like that. And I did play for a couple of years, but I just wasn't into it, man. I just, you know, I just was, I would rather have been doing other things. And I met cool people and, you know, the guy like the, got along with the coaches and everything. But uh, I just enjoyed my art classes more and, and my writing classes and, and just pursuits like uh, academic pursuits, like extracurricular stuff more like Odyssey of the Mind, Latin Club. I was doing all that stuff. Um, and so I just was more drawn to that. That's that's more I wanted to, where I wanted to dedicate my time. And it, it became apparent pretty quickly to me that sports was not necessarily the only way I was going to get to go to college. Like there were other avenues uh, because I started getting courted pretty early on where, I, you know, to where I knew like, oh, I might have a little help because there was no help coming from the family or whatever. So I wasn't so worried about, OK, this I got to play ball because that's the only way I'm getting to school, that kind of thing. So I, I, I dropped it because I that's that's one of the first uh, times I remember having the feeling where I'm like, I don't have to do this if I'm not into it, you know, just because it's good. I'm doing it to make other people happy. It's, it's not for me. So uh, I dropped it pretty quickly and just focused on the other things and embraced my true weirdo self. Now you also start playing bass, correct? I'm playing in bands, playing in punk bands, ska bands. Right. Yeah. It was uh, guitar first. Yeah. I started, my dad is a guitarist, although he did not teach me to play guitar. It's very important. That's how I got exposed to it. But uh, he, he teaches guitar like he, teaches people how to drive like i it just was that would not work you know he <laughs> he does not suffer fools he gets he loses his temper pretty quickly so i just knew that actually turned me off of it at first and so but i was still into the sound that it made and the music you could make with it so around the time of their like i was super into guns and roses and metallic and stuff like that but at the time i i knew pretty quickly i was like man i'm not gonna be able to play like slash you know immediately like that's gonna take work it makes my fingers hurt but then like when nirvana and things like that punk rock i, I discovered punk rock and simpler things a simpler gateway i was like oh okay i can start here and then work my way into it that way and that's really what blew the doors open for me uh and that's when i really really got into it and i was just self-taught i would just buy I would buy mag guitar magazines and they would have the tablature in them and I would just teach myself how to play. And then I would, uh, again, it wasn't like the internet, like now with the internet where you can go figure out how music theory works. You know, I just sort of like have to figure it out myself. 
Um, and it was right in between, you know, you hear those old school stories of people just putting on a record and learning to play along to it. It wasn't so much like that. I mean, at least I had a guide on paper, but it was still, you know, kind of in the middle of where we're at now and the, the old school way. And that's kind of how I, I bulldozed my way into it. And I knew, I knew a few music, hung out with a few musicians that were, you know, much more accomplished than me in high school. And, uh, they, they had bands, so I kind of started hanging around. And at first, I was just a screamer, you know, or like a hype man because <laughs> I, couldn't, I couldn't hold my own instrumentally. Uh, but then, like, you know, in the background, I, I would kind of I watch. I'd be like, okay, well, this is how he plays this, and this side gets from this to this, and these chords sound good together. And then I kind of started developing my own thing, you know, and eventually, yeah playing leading forming bands leading bands writing songs you know and this is all through high school you're you're, you're yeah. writing stories being creative on that front as well as being in bands basically being all around a 90s uh grunge kid or what exactly so you go to college tell me about what college you went to and uh i know yes in college it was pretty that's kind of where you had the watershed moment of, of pursuing film correct right yeah because i guess i left out the uh, uh, when I went, when I started college, uh, I started college at the University of Texas Austin, and I started as an aerospace engineering major with a minor in film, because that childhood, that whole time, I was also drawn to airplanes, rocket ships, NASA. Like I was super into that stuff, making model airplanes out of balsa wood, flying rockets, and I kind of wanted to be, you know, part of that whole going going to space thing. I'd have all the space Lego sets and everything. And, and I, so I started that and at the end of my, you know, kind of midway through my first semester, actually, I quickly realized while, while I could get through all the science classes, cause you had to take, like, if you, if that was going to be your focus, it was mostly aerospace, physics, math, you know, classes that you had to take like right out of the gate. Boom. And I'm having a lot of good friends in those classes, but I just was not, and I could do the work. I just was not into the classes. It, it just wasn't jazzing me up. And I knew, and I, I knew like I had a counterpoint because I had one film class. It was a film history class. And it was on an entirely different side of the campus. You know, everybody knows where the media building at UT is now. It was the, that building, whereas the engineering stuff was, you know, diametrically opposed on the other side over by Irwin Center or whatever. Um, so I would go all the way to the other side of the campus, but it's also like you'd go through like this weird, weirdo transition because that that building is right across it's on guadalupe and so right across the street are all those clubs like hole in the wall and things like that where where um you know bands would play and it was still like weirdo you know the drag at that time this before, was 90s, before, 90s yeah, slacker the, slacker era yeah, exactly right? exactly like robert rodriguez was still probably cutting his movie you know in the access station or whatever it was like around that time and so the vibe just almost completely changed. It was like the Wizard of Oz, where everything goes black and white to color. You know, the, the film history class, while well, a lot of the stuff I knew, a lot of the stuff I didn't. Like, I hadn't been turned on to a lot of, uh, you know, the Odessa step sequence or things like that. Like, that's where I sort of learned a lot of that older film history stuff. And I was just captivated by it, you know, because all I really knew of black and white movies was at the time was like, you know, stuff you would catch on TV easily or like Universal Monster stuff that is a horror fan you can't get away from. And like, Hitchcock hammer horror stuff like thing. that. Hey, yeah, exactly. But then I would start, um, uh, you know, they, the professor would show films where you're like, this is where they got this from in the untouchables. You know, this is where the sequence came from, or this is what they're referencing, you know? And it would just, you know, it, it clearly was stoking a fire. In me. And, and I was just having, I was so much more engaged in those classes. So by the time that that happened, um, I, I, you know, I quickly realized, okay, well, I need to be, I need to be majoring in film and minor in something else. Like I'm not really into this aerospace stuff. And that actually pissed a lot of people off because uh, they start, I, I think now looking back on it, there weren't a lot of, you know, people of color in that program at the time. So I think they were kind of looking at me as like, okay, we can use this guy as like a spokesperson maybe in the future, you know, we got our and spike Lee. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and I always think about there's this old uh, there's this old commercial about uh, uh, maths and sciences and how minorities should 
should engage more in those classes and in, in those uh, uh, in those jobs. And it was Sinbad. And he was like, you know, he's floating in space. He's like, how do you think these astronauts get out of here? Get out of here. That's the math. <laughs> I'm like, they just want me to be the new Sinbad out floating in space. And so they got pretty pissed when I was like, OK, it was it was kind of just like the football thing. Uh, but I just knew in my heart that I wasn't into it and that I would eventually if I stay, I would just be unhappy and, you know, w- uh, you know, uh, not be into doing any of this stuff. So I just flipped it. And then I at the same time, I started uh, I discovered this publication called Indie Slate that had film jobs listed in the back. And I started working on sets in the Austin area, which at the time there was a lot because it was that whole Richard Linklater made Slacker. Robert Rodriguez had made El Mariachi and had just published Rebel Without a Crew. So everybody like, and at the time people were still shooting on film. So it was a little bit harder, but you could still find sets to go work on and start learning the craft. And we at, at school in the film classes, we're still using film. So that's how long ago it was before the digital revolution. Man. So did you ever bump elbows with uh with Linkletter or anybody of that Austin uh, crew? Yeah, Link both Linkletter and Rodriguez came and spoke at the school while I was there. And I got to see them both. And Linkletter I've run into a couple of times just at events and stuff, both there and here, because he's from Houston. Uh and I actually my second year there, he shot um suburbia right down the street from where I was living. So I went, it's, it was like the, the, the stop and go they were shooting at was a real, you know, convenience store that was on, uh, well, it was right off William Cannon. And so we went over there and just hung out. I just remember standing behind Parker Posey for like three hours watching them shoot. And she was just, she, she would just look back at us and wave occasionally, but yeah, they let us get pretty close to the set and check it all out. As long as we were quiet. Yeah. I mean, I think kids getting into film now don't realize what, that time period was like and especially austin was kind of the nucleus of that like you know we can make a film by ourselves we don't need hollywood we don't need the man to help it was it was punk rock filmmaking yeah 100 percent. yeah so yeah go ahead it was the filmmaking version of the music scene like anybody that could just whatever i need to make this happen you know let's go do it and yeah it was it was pretty awesome pretty awesome vibe so you do that, you graduate with a film degree instead of an aerospace degree. Um, but not from there. There's a twist in the story. I actually moved back to Houston for a girl, stupidly. Uh, <laughs> I, I often wish I'd stayed in Austin because I probably could have plugged into that scene more. But I did. I got homesick. I, you know, there was a lot going on, but I kind of moved back with my tail between my legs. Gave a lot of that scholarship stuff up, so I kind of screwed myself a little bit. But <clears throat> and it was what's funny is I was moving back, but I wasn't really moving back to anything because I wasn't close with my family. A lot of my friends had all scattered to go to schools, different schools. So it, you know, I I, I think I just there was part of me that just really I just wanted familiarity and comfort and had i just stayed longer i probably would have got that in austin but i moved back here got a job got a couple of jobs and then uh it was about a year and a half maybe two years i took off and then i started school again i went to u of age and that's actually where i you know went through the rest of the program and u of h at the time they didn't have i don't i still don't think they had it was like a tele radio television degree it wasn't a film degree so i quickly realized that you know, oh, I made a mistake. I should have stayed at UT because it was a bigger program. They had more opportunity, but I made it work. And then had I not done, had I not moved back here, I wouldn't have gotten a job at the public access station. I wouldn't have had access to the equipment and I wouldn't have made my fa- first feature. So, you know, maybe it kind of did work out, but there's, I always have could have, should have, would have. What, what story. year was that where you were working with the public access and using their equipment? I started there. I want to say it was 90, 1998, probably 97, 98. Because when I, I went to Houston community college in like 95, 96, I think it was 96 and yeah. did their video production class. And they were trying to push people, Hey, go, you want to make a feature, go work at public access. You can use their equipment. Yeah. You know, yeah. and uh, I always wanted to do it. Of course I just never pulled the trigger. So uh, yeah. who knows? Yeah. That's exactly what, when I was working at the Olive Garden over here off two ninety. 
uh, <laughs> I just remember cleaning up my station and this guy, Brian was like, man, you want to make movies? You should go check out this public access station. They, they let you use equipment. I was like, really? I never, right. And I, I had to look it up in the yellow pages. This is how long ago this was looked it up in the yellow pages. I remember seeing the ad and going, Oh, I should call us. And they're like, yeah, come in for an orientation. And then <clears throat> the minute, and I mean, the minute I got in there, I was like, oh, okay, yeah, I can make this work. And it was, you know, it was weird because at the time it was still, everything's video based, you know, cause it's TV oriented. So it was like camera going to a beta cam deck that you had to carry. Like it's an ENG kit, you know, but still I'm like, okay, it's something I can capture an image with. I can make something, you know, and I shot, you know, I shot a couple of videos for my band at the time that way. And, Started doing just short, you know, uh, short film or short video type stuff and really just kind of getting used to editing because they had editing stations that we could use. Uh, so I started as a producer there, but then I got a job there, which really kind of, you know, that could use the equipment whenever I wanted. And I worked there for a few years. And so tell me about this first feature. And, you know, we could we could talk about the other features, but the first feature is always like the monster to 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 overcome right it's the it's the mountain decline oh yeah yeah it was yeah it was brutal it's still looking back it was brutal but i my idea was uh i was going to it was it's funny because i guess i was ahead of my time in a lot of ways but because it was video we were shooting on video and it was going to be a small if non-existent if if not non-existent crew was it svhs at that time uh yeah, that's what we mainly used. The the can or no, it was the Sony X2, JVC X2, I think it was. But uh, those are the those are the top of the line cameras that we had. And so my idea was it was going to be not found footage necessarily, but security camera footage type feature kind of thing. Um, just kind of following this, following this woman around, and uh, bad things start happening. Your friends start dying. Spoiler alert, you find out at the end that it's her ex-boyfriend who's a filmmaker who's just decided this is the easiest way he's going to make his first movie. And so um, so that's that was kind of how I, you know, how I put it together. And we shot we shot a lot of it in my apartment at the time. And uh, I shot a lot of it in Austin with my girlfriend at the time was part of a theater troupe at St. Edwards University. So that's where a lot of the actors came from, a lot of whom I still work with. And uh, they also let us use the theater up there so we could run, you know, we had a large area to run around. St. Edwards has a lot of cool buildings too. So we could shoot on the campus a little bit. So that was cool. Give us some production value, but that's how that's that feature was called fade to black. And I keep toying with releasing it somehow, but, and I have it digitized. I just, I look at it now and I'm just like, ugh, you know, just like anybody does to the first stuff they make, but it's kind of hard for me to watch, but, it's also, you know, cute. Like, like I'm like, oh, look what I was trying to do. <laughs> look what I was trying to accomplish. Bless my heart. So one day, yeah, one day, we actually, right before the pandemic, I think, <clears throat> we were playing with the idea of doing a live script reading of it with all the same people because I keep in touch with everybody. And uh, we still may do that. It just kind of, it got blown up, I think, because of COVID. But uh, I think we might still do that. And that may be a way to kind of bring it back to life. And, How'd you finance it? How'd you get the money? Finance. So it it cost me a grand total of three hundred and fifty dollars because I could check out the equipment for free. Everything else was donated, you know. So we didn't really spend that. That was kind of when I started entering into festivals. That was kind of the selling point they used, and I was like, maybe don't tell everybody that right out of the gate. (laughs) But it did. It did play a few things. It won a couple awards. So you know. Well, that was the whole Duplass, you know, strategy, you know, Duplass Brothers. Right. Oh, we, we made this movie for 73 cents, you know what I mean? And, you know. So. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. Our, our paths kind of crossed. It's kind of weird how that, yeah. that was. I was doing that around the same time. Except they were in Austin at the time, and I was here. Uh, but a lot of my friends from Austin worked with them on their first few movies. So, again, had I just stayed there, maybe I'd be making Mumblecore. <laughs> heck yeah if only but um so then what's next for you 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 just jump to your next movie yeah uh you mean after like currently or after no no after yeah 
after Fade to Black? What was what was the next? yeah after? Well, uh, there was a man. There was a long stretch of uh, what? Because what was it? Oh yeah, there was a long stretch of maybe I want to say spinning my tires. Like I kind of I I did start. I started writing the script. And I think I even finished the script for what eventually became Walking Distance, which was a psychic experiment. I did write that script and it was ready to go, but it was a much bigger movie. Like, at, and at the time, again, everybody's shooting on film. You knew that if you wanted to make a real movie, that you needed a million bucks. That was what everybody said. You literally need a million dollars to make a movie. And a couple of people I had known in, in town had more or less made that happen. So I'm like, okay, well, how do I start raising money? Well, first, let me write this script and uh, see if I can get anybody interested. And at the time I wrote the script, it was a zombie movie, which at the, this is before the zombie resurgence. This is before 28 Days Later, before George Romero even made, a, made Land of the Dead. You know, It was like there hadn't been a zombie movie, or at least they were under the radar type things. So I, And at the time, I remember going, oh, you know what? In my zombie movie, I'm going to have zombies run. That's going to be a new thing. And of course, I never got it made. So, and I sat on the script for so long that 28 Days Later came out, and I'm like, holy shit, they did it. And they shot it on video, and it's awesome, and it's Danny Boyle. So, I can't do that. So, <clears throat> I started retooling that script into what it eventually became. But there was just like a long sort of fallow period where I wasn't making anything. I did a couple of videos for my band because that was the easiest way to come up with something to shoot. Uh, but that got old pretty quick, and I wanted to make a feature, you know. and it just wasn't happening. It wasn't happening. And then eventually, because of my first movie, Fade to Black, when, when I wanted to premiere Fade to Black here in Houston, I decided to do like a Lollapalooza thing. And I was like, I'm going to book. I'm just going to book out a theater and I'm going to program a film festival with films from my friends that I would like to see and that I want other people to see that might not get to see them. And then my movie will headline it. So I kind of put together this awesome lineup of just, you know, people I want to have a festival with. And uh, I did it at the Aurora Picture Show in, it was November of 2001, which made it difficult because nobody wanted to fly. Of course, we didn't even know if people could fly. Um, but uh, we I went ahead and did it. And it you ended up 2001. Pretty, you said 2001. 2001. What yeah, can they so fly in 2001? September 11th. It just happened. Oh yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was so I had already, I had the plans in like the summer and try to book it out far enough to where, you know, it'll be right before Thanksgiving. People kind of be into the whole like winding down spirit. But let me, you know, it'll be a good weekend. And then of course all that happened, everything's up in the air, you know, like no one knew if they could do anything, but it did turn out that a lot of people drove in for it. Some people were able to fly. Uh, and one of the other movies that I programmed was another movie that I had seen at a film festival that they to black and played. And it was these dudes from Chicago and uh, they, we just, we hit it off. They were horror fans, but they were also super into comedy. Their movie was a comedy. I, we thought it was hilarious. So we just really got along and I had a relationship with these guys. So then I think <clears throat> if I'm not mistaken, the very next year they decided to shoot their next movie, which was a horror film. And by this time the digital revolution had kind of happened. So we all had, they were shooting on the Panasonic D Panasonic DVX 100. I had just gotten one. And so I said, Hey, I've got the same camera you guys are shooting on. You're shooting over Memorial day weekend in Chicago. I haven't shot anything in a long time. I'm just itching to do something. I will pay my, I will pay to get myself up there and help you shoot just like B roll second camera behind the scenes, whatever. I'll have an extra camera for you. If you get, you know, and that way we get to hang out too. And so, and they're like, cool, that sounds great. So I get myself up there. And by the end of the weekend, I ended up DPing their movie because the guy they had, I don't want to say he didn't know what he was doing, but he wasn't experienced at shooting stuff like that. You know, like I remember him going, oh, what are these? He didn't know what gels were. <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> so Yikes. I had to explain like some of the other stuff in the lighting get to him. And so, but I mean, it wasn't, I, it, I wasn't trying to be a jerk about it. We actually ended up hitting it off like that. We made a pretty good team. And like, so we just took this two camera approach and then I taught it. I told, taught him everything I had learned from just like shooting DPing stuff. And, you know, I was teaching the, the camera and lighting classes at access by this point. So I had some knowledge about it. And uh, so I ended up 
you know, shooting their feature for them. And then that led to them getting that deal for, to do witchcraft 13 and they didn't want to direct it. So they offered it to me because I had done that for them in Chicago in uh, Chicago. And that ended up being a poison chalice for a lot of way- reasons, but it still gave me, you know, it was my second movie, my second feature. And that one had with be, being witchcraft that had guaranteed distribution. Which I think the first witchcraft movie came out, if I'm not mistaken, in like 1987. So as a kid going into video stores, there would always be a new one of these things. And I think up until maybe seven or eight, they would even still get reviewed in Fangoria by Dr. Cyclops. And, um, we would always make fun of these movies. We're like, man, what? There's seven of because at the time, that was the highest number any series had gotten to, pretty much. I mean, unless you're not counting James Bond, which aren't like numbered ones and there are breaks, you know what I mean? But you're like, there wasn't, you know, that many Friday the thirteenth or Fast and Furiouses or whatever, which is where we're used to like these long running things. So we're like, dude, who keeps cranking these out? You know? And um, uh, we're like, I, was, I remember looking and seeing like part eight on a video store shelf and going, I oh, mean, what idiot got talked into doing another one of these. And sure enough, you know, a few, few instances later, I was that idiot. So, uh, and it was basically, it was, uh, they wanted to, because they just want to maintain the rights on these movies. They give film, they give newbie filmmakers horrible deals to make a new one. And I think la- just last year, someone made, 14, 15, 16 altogether and released them. So they're still doing it. So there's, you know, I mean, the sucker born every minute. So, so um, there was, there was a pause between 13 and 14, 15, 16. Yes. Because I, I was definitely the, uh, I definitely gave them issues because they wanted to, they, they really wanted to screw me over both the guys that owned the witchcrafts, you know, uh, trademark and the guys at Chicago. Uh, they were trying to do some real shady shit. And so I called them on it, refused to give them the movie unless they paid us, which was only $3,000, mind you, which is the entire, that was the entirety they were going to give us for the budget of the movie and paying people or whatever. I had to come out of pocket first and then they were going to reimburse me. And when it came time to give them the movie, they, you know, they were like, well, you know, give us the movie first and then we'll throw me the idol and I'll throw you the whip. You know what I mean? So, and I was like, nah, man, come on. So, so the budget was three thousand for the entire movie. That's what they told us we could spend. I ended up spending probably more like seven, just because it. Um, it I knew it was going to be out on video shelves, so I do, I wanted to put my best foot forward. So like we rented a cave out in uh, Bernie, Texas. Like we, you know, hired the best special effects artists that we could for that much money. I tried to pay everybody. Everybody got paid but me, essentially. Uh, because my payment was going to be the credit on a video at a video, you know, that came out in mass distribution. Because at the time, that was pretty hard to do. So, uh, yeah, but that happened. It turned into a real shit show. Uh, I had, you know, I fell out with those guys in Chicago over it. Uh, it fractured a lot of relationships. It showed me who a lot of people truly were. And that kind of, that really, soured me on the whole making movies thing for a little bit, but also I wanted to cleanse myself of it and make something else almost immediately after we got out of it. So that's what led to closet space, which uh, uh, a friend of mine, Jason Stewart had this script lying around that uh, he had written on spec for a video production company, but they ended up not making it out in California. And I read it and liked it and said, well, maybe we should try to make it here. And the I had befriended a few lawyers that had helped me with the witchcraft stuff, and they decided they wanted to help me produce something else again, just to sort of get the funk of that stuff off of me. <laughs> so that's how Closet Space came about. So that was my third movie, and that was uh, we shot that in I want to say 2008. Witchcraft, we shot in no, we shot Closet Space in 2007. Witchcraft, we shot in 2005, and I remember that because it, we shot it the same year that Melanie and I got married. So that was a real busy year for us and a real financially (laughs) trying time. Melanie, you could have had an aerospace engineer, but you got a filmmaker. Yep. Yep. That's true. (laughs) I don't know if that's a, uh, 
a positive or a negative depends, I guess. But, yeah, well, she ended up being the lead of Closet Space, so I guess it worked out for her. <laughs> and how'd that shoot go? Uh, it went well. Looking back on it, it went well. It was stressful at the time just, just because we're, you know, trying to do a lot with a little money. And we're shooting in the heat of summer in Texas. Like, we always, it seemed to be our routine. We'd have to wait and shoot until it got its hottest. And uh, about it. Same here. Yeah. So, uh, but it ended up going pretty well. Again, it was just, we thought that, we thought that it was really going to make waves. And it didn't. And I don't think it was part, I don't think it was delusional on our part because there are people that made, I think, not as effective films for less money that went on to do bigger things. Some of those people have movies in the theater right now that are like, people are going crazy over. And I'm like, well, what's the difference? You know, what's the difference between that movie and this movie? They, I feel like our effects look better. I feel like our performances are better, but it just, for whatever reason, it didn't happen. And I think a lot of it was because I was out here doing it instead of out in LA uh, at the same parties, going to Universal Horror Nights with all these same people and making inroads that way. You know, I think I just became kind of persona non grata. And so I think it started there. But, you know, it is what it is. I it's it's hard. It's way harder to make movies out in California. It's way more expensive. And I think you almost have to it almost has to be like a nepotism situation or, you know, or else it's it's, you know, impossible. So. Well, especially at that uh, time, it was definitely some somebody had to grant you the keys to the kingdom, right? You know, um, I don't know what it is now at post COVID. What you know, so many productions have moved and out of California, so who knows what's going on? But yeah, that definitely you needed somebody, if not nepotism, some you had to be part of a crew. You had to you had to get in in order to uh, you know have the successful career, uh, right? Right. And then, you know, in that, in that time since I've worked on, I've worked on some of those productions that have benefited from nepotism that are shooting out there. And I just watch the way they just burn money and waste it, you know, and don't appreciate what they've got or know how to maximize the opportunity. And it's so frustrating. And, you know, then these movies either never come out or, they trickle out with no fanfare and it's it's pretty much like you just literally you literally wasted a million dollars you literally wasted a million dollars and i could have made at least 10 movies off at of least. that at least. at least at least you know um so you know that's why i still that's why i'm making movies out here so then we get to the fourth feature which was so we did use the closet space right so Closet Space, then I went on to make, it was called Walking Distance for most of its life. And that was the zombie movie I'd started right after Fade to Black. I started writing it, but then it, zombie movies came back. It became a big deal. Um, <clears throat> and so I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to do zombies because everybody's into zombies. So let me make it something else. And then it started taking on this more sci-fi, weird Akira kind of fire starter you know, uh, government messing with psychic powers kind of thing, <clears throat> which I've always been into. Uh, so, so that's, that actually, I think that brought out things that in the script that kind of were never really at the forefront. So I was, I was prepped to make that next. And it, again, it was going to be a step up. And I had met, <clears throat> I'd met someone on closet space uh, his name is James Lamar. He was the guy that he was interested in helping me make my next movie. He was an actor in Closet Space, but he was trying to get into more producing type of stuff. And he had made some inroads into doing that. And so that is kind of how we took the next step up. So whereas Closet Space cost us, I think it cost us 30000 maybe $35,000. Psychic Experiment we did for 150000 so it was a giant step up, but I mean, we, I still look at that movie and I'm like, God, how do we, how do we make it for that? Because we had, I think like 17 locations all throughout Texas. We blew up this school in Galveston, like not literally, but I mean, <laughs> you know, we had to, they, they, they let us have the run of the place. Um, 
we sent a hundred, maybe 200 bloody people, bloody extras running down the strands. You know, we did a lot for a little and uh, yeah. So that came out and that was actually the thing that led to that getting released. The way it was, was that <clears throat> we had cast, we cast Katie Featherston in a small role because I had seen some of the horror sites had already started talking about paranormal activity. It had just been bought by DreamWorks, but not many people had seen it yet. And they didn't know if they were going to release it as is or remake it. It was kind of in limbo. So if you if you had seen it yet, you had seen it at one of the festivals that it had played at. But I just kept hearing these horror guys talk about how much they loved the movie, how effective it was. And it turned come to find out that Katie Featherston and James Lamar, the guy I mentioned that was my producer, I think they shared an agent. Katie's from Dallas. So we had this one role that we hadn't cast yet. And I kept seeing her name over and over. And I was like, dude, why don't we try to get her in? Like, if nothing else, I had no idea paranormal activity was going to be what it was. I just knew that a bunch of horror people liked it. So if nothing else, here's another name actor from the genre that people might go see because these guys all like this movie. And then by the time that we finished Psychic Experiment, you know, paranormal activity two had come out and they were already on the way to three. So it, was, it had become a phenomenon. And so she then became the biggest name in the movie. And so that's what brought Lionsgate's attention because she hadn't done anything else yet. Uh, that's what brought it to Lionsgate's attention. And then they bought it and put it out over here. And then uh, I think one of the subsidiaries put it out worldwide. And uh, that's the, that's actually the Japanese poster for it behind me. <laughs> I didn't even know it was out in Japan. I had a Japanese fan reach out to me through somebody, a mutual friend and, or actually he, the mutual friend saw it. And this Japanese guy was talking about having watched it. And the friend was like, Oh, that's Mel's movie. And so he tagged me in it, and I'm like, Hey dude, can you send me a picture of that? So I got it printed out, but it's like, I, it's out. That's the thing about it. It's like, you get these big releases that seem to be awesome, but then like, they don't communicate really with you. You're a small cog in a very big machine. And you don't hear about what's really going on with your flick. So it's like I have to search this stuff out. But it has come out all over the world. Every so often, I still get a message about it. Um, I look at it now, and I obviously just see the the warts. You know, like, oh, we could have done this differently. And why did I waste so much time on that when I should have focused on this? Because, again, it was another of those things where I was wearing a lot of hats. Like, I was doing a lot. I was directing. I, was, uh, I did part of the score. I edited. I... Um, had to do some of the set design, set building on days that we were off from the shoot. Chris and I are in my warehouse, just like building the next set. So there were no real days off for me. And the whole time I'm actually, I was working a day job too. So it was pretty rough, but not uncommon. You know, that's just kind of what you have to do to make it work. If you don't want to take most of the budget to pay yourself, you know? Uh, but yeah, that's uh, that was movie number four. And number five was mystery spot. There was a huge gap between four and five. Now that's yeah. the movie you, you, you have out now yep. dropped recently and tell me about that one. Yeah. So mystery spot it's, it took, you know, 10 years between psychic experiment coming out and uh, me doing actually mystery spot getting released. I think it was like 11 years between the two, but it's because after psychic experiment happened, Again, you know, Lionsgate released my movie. I thought things were going to change. I thought well, I was going to take the next step up. You know, I didn't think I'd be directing X-Men or whatever, but I thought I'd at least, you know, maybe get a Children of the Corn sequel or something, you know. Blumhouse I I just, would come calling. Right. And uh, figured I'd make the next move up. And, of course, that didn't happen. You know, it, again, sort of, it came out, didn't really make any waves. Uh, nothing. You know, it's I had a movie to show for it. it. It actually there was a DVD, but that's about it. So then I started to think, oh, well, maybe the answer is I do need to go out to L.A. and start working on stuff and start glad handing and making inroads that way. And I did that. So I ended up working on other people's movies for several years, um, usually as an assistant director or as a line producer, which I ended up being pretty good at because I had to do it on all these other movies in addition to directing. But, you know. I don't enjoy doing that job. There are, those are two of the most stressful jobs on the set. And long story short, it eventually nearly killed me. So I was working on a movie and I had, I had an episode 
And that's when I, I was in Las Vegas in a hospital. And I said, okay, from here on out, I'm not wasting my time or energy on anybody else's stuff because I put just as much energy into that. And then it never matters. You don't get paid that well. Uh, you have to travel around constantly. You're never home. You never get to sleep in your own bed and you don't get, you know, when a movie comes out, nobody gives a shit who the assistant director is. You know what I mean? You get no kind of fulfillment, artistic fulfillment off of it. Not that those jobs aren't important, but for the toll it was taking on me, I wanted a little something. And in a lot of those cases, if it weren't for me, or in a lot of cases, Chris is there with me, the movie would have not gotten finished. You know what I mean? Like we kind of would held, hold the shit together in a lot of, because a lot of these guys, it is nepotism and they've never made a movie before. They don't know how to plan. They don't know how to budget. So I just had enough of it and decided, okay, I'm going to, I am going to write a movie about my frustrations, not being able to make a movie. And the movie that I wrote actually was a dark comedy called In Betweening, which is feature number six. I'm jumping a little ahead. And so I, I was like, okay, well, I'm going to write that script. It's going to be very autobiographical. And I'm going to try to just crowdfund it because everybody's crowdfunding. There seems to be people that have some success with it. I have a little bit of a fan base. Maybe that'll work. And I did that, fell flat on my face. I think we raised like $300, 150 of which was my own, you know? And just it just really frustrated me and really pissed me off. And uh, so in my in my rage, I wrote Mystery Spot about sort of the the other side of that, the dark side about having to go work on these jobs you don't want to work, not ask many questions and take whatever paycheck you get, not seeing your family, uh, ruining your health in the process, and kind of just you know maybe wanting to die along the way, you know, just not, not having a good time. And so I wrote mystery spot over a weekend, essentially. And it really was just me venting those experiences, but I actually sent, I wrote the part, uh, I wrote a part for Lisa Wilcox, who I tried to work with on other films. There was a film we tried to get going for years that never got off the ground. Uh, with, that's a whole other story. For those but, uh, Lisa Wilcox from Friday the 13th fame. Nightmare on, Elm Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street. Yeah. 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 But, you know, Adrian King of Friday the 13th fame was in Psychic Experiment. So I could see why it would you'd mix them up. And their characters are both called Alice. So even more confusing. <laughs> but um, uh, so I wrote a role for Lisa from in Mystery Spot. And so I said, you know, I don't even know if this is workable. I just kind of wrote it in a blackout creative state. I'll let her read it, see what she thinks. And she got back to me and was very supportive and loved it and, you know, said it was one of the best things she'd ever read. So we should try to make it. So it took me a few years to try to get around to making that. But that movie actually ended up getting made first because it's the more commercial of the two by far. And uh, where I, and then I put in between and sort of in my back pocket. Uh, so, yeah, we made Mystery Spot with a couple of producers I had met working on movies out in LA, some of the better experiences I'd had the whole time I would work on their movies or movies they were involved with. They're like, Hey Mel, you know, we could find money. If you have anything, let us know. If you have anything, let us know. Then it came to a point to where I was, I was between jobs. I had no options and I was just trying to throw everything at the wall to see what stuck. I said, you know what? Maybe I should try to get a movie finance. And I reached out to the producers, Lyle and Audrey. And I said, hey, I've got this mystery spot movie. Are you interested? Thinking that they might, they probably wouldn't be because nine times out of 10, you know, when it comes time to say yes, people don't, they talk a game, but they don't really say yes. They don't commit. And within two days, they call me back and they're like, we're in, we're ready to make it. And I'm like, oh, okay. So we're off to the races. And in the time that, in the time that that took to happen, I had written it to be, to be shot at one motel that I'd found down near Galveston. That's why there's all this beach stuff in the movie too. But in the time that it took to actually become a real boy, that hotel had changed hands. So those owners were not down with us shooting there. So they gave me a green light. We didn't even have a location. I'm like, Oh, I better go find a motel that works. So I had to take a weekend and find one real quick and act like I'd had it all along. <laughs> and I just kind of lucked out that way uh, with Dan and Lenny set the Hepstead in. They were great. Uh, and it ended up being the perfect place because it had, that field next door where we could build the mystery spot had that building that did have to work for us. So, uh, because it, initially I was thought I'd have to cheat all that, but we started shooting that on uh, labor day of 2019. 
And then we wrapped it up in two weeks. I admit we had minimal reshoots or pickups. I think I shot a couple of things just to make things clearer. Then we went into post-production. Of course, we were granted the gift of a long post-production because COVID hit in March 2020. So uh, I had already edited a lot of the movie, but that just really slowed everything down because that was the point where we were starting to have to do ADR. And so myself and the sound engineer, Greg Vosberg, had to devise this mobile ADR kit where I had to go get, I got a Mac laptop. I just found a cheap one, got a cheap mic, a cheap but usable mic and a cheap but usable soundboard and packed it up. And We shipped it around to all the actors. Like Lisa was in Las Vegas. Graham was in LA at the time. A few of the actors are in Houston. I would drive it around to them and they would remote in to Greg, who was in Los Angeles. And they do, they would do his, they would do ADR with him over, uh, you know, over the internet. And it actually worked out. And uh, I'm still surprised that we made it work, but that's kind of how we had to deal with that. And then everything else, when I had to do my final sound mix with them, it was remote, you know, everything we, we had, we found out because <clears throat> we had sent a rough cut of the movie. If I'm not mistaken, it was a rough cut to Fright Fest because they had asked about it. And then we found out that we were going to premiere there. So we kind of had a hard premiere date that we had to make and everything else just became a remote mix, remote color session. You know, because we premiered the movie, the world premiere was at Fright Fest in London in uh, August of last year, August of 2021. So, and then it's been playing festivals since then. And then it came out worldwide via Terror Films last Friday, October 7th. And um, I love it. I think it's great. I was lucky enough to see it, you know, in theaters when you were shown in a few different places. Um, yeah. But more importantly, a little movie called In Betweening with a, a young actor <laughs> on the rise. Yep. Derek Fury. I've heard like, good things. Yeah, there's there, there's a buzz. There's a buzz in uh, <laughs> in Hollywood. Yeah. But uh so um tell me a little bit about in betweening. So yeah, in you know, in betweening, like I said, it was written first because it was me venting a lot of the frustrations that I've kind of I've even vented on here, you know, stuff that I don't talk about much because, you know, you get branded bitter or whatever, but, you know, it's, if any there's definitely, this will make you bitter. Right. Right. Yeah. Especially this you, one. Yeah. Right. So it's like, and you know, it's like, okay, the first time, what's that thing that it's from James Bond. It's like the first time is happenstance. The second time is coincidence. The third time is enemy action. You know, <laughs> like, Yes. Like if things there's a there's a pattern, you know what I mean? Yeah. And absolutely. a lot of the com and there's there's a lot of the conversations I see. And I mean it's I'll sort of forget about this stuff and let go of it a little bit, then it'll happen all over again with something else, you know. Um and so I had to I had to get that out of me to keep from making myself sick over it. This time next so, year, me and Mel will be bitter enemies. We'll both be saying how <laughs> one screwed the other one over. Yeah, totally. That's how that's how it always ends. You know, that's how it always ends. But um so in between was me venting all that out. And again, I started the script, you know, years ago, but I've kind of been updating and adding to it <clears throat> as things happen. But once I did mystery spot, you know, I, I was like, man, I got it. I've got to do in between. And a lot of the experience of mystery spot kind of led me back to that script too, because there's frustrations that came along with that. Um, so I revisited it was trying to figure out how I'd do it. I didn't really want to do the crowdfunding thing again. And then just on a whim, I applied for this grant, uh, this uh, Houston Houston Art Alliance grant. And just because I never really, I never get things like that. I've applied a few times, but I knew that I would regret it if I didn't try. So I, I, I tried. And then on my birthday last, yeah, last year, they actually sent me an email on my birthday that said that I got the grant. And that they would disperse in January. And I said, oh, well, I guess we're making a movie. So <clears throat> I quickly put everything together. And fortunately, I had written a lot of the stuff in in between four specific people. And they've been ride or die for it since, you know, from the get-go. So they're just like, let me know when you're ready for me. And a lot of them were in mystery spot or involved with it somehow. So they're ready to rock. So the only thing I really had to do was coordinate and angelo from angelo moore from fishbone is a major character in the script as he has been in my life because that band i think represents a lot 
uh, of a similar struggle to what I'm going through film wise. Um, they're black dudes playing what's thought of as white music, white music. They historically have had a hard time fitting in with one or the other. Black radio wouldn't play them. White radio wouldn't really play them. You know, they were a bit too much. But then you see similar watered down versions of what they do go on to great fame. So it's like I feel, you know, there's a lot of parallels with what I'm dealing with and have been for my entire life. Listen, I mean, they've been a band for 40 years. So I've been listening to them for a very long time since I was in middle school. So I thought, well, Angelo would be a good person to be in this as like my spirit, the, the key lead character's spirit animal uh, playing himself. And he was totally down. I just had to work it in with their schedule because they they had been touring again. And uh, so he was ready to rock. And we shot most of the movie in March of you know this past March, March 2022. I just got back from a weekend in Los Angeles where I shot a few pickups with Angelo and we recorded part of the song. There's a musical number in the movie. So we recorded part of that. And then I have a few pickups coming up next month. And then I think we're done. But there's there are a lot of animated portions of the script because what a lot of people don't know is the title in betweening refers to in betweeners, which are it's an animation term, which are the people that like the lead animator will do like frame one and frame ten. Like if you have Bugs Bunny walking or whatever, you have the major steps in frame one and ten, and then the in betweeners will come in and animate all the stuff in the middle to keep the lead guys just working on the main, you know, the most important frames. But you know they've got to stay on model and everything. But it also refers to how I've sort of been living this double life in between being black, in between being white. Also, the weird limbo in between the movies and what people think is going on versus what is really going on. So it it's about all of that stuff. But it's definitely a much more comedic approach than, say, Mystery Spot. Like, it, there's a lot of crazy conversations that are almost verbatim. I say almost because a lot of the stuff I had to pull back on because if I said the reality you wouldn't believe me you know well the, the three thousand uh, dollar budget we talked about earlier kind of came up in the scene that i was i was a yes, part of exactly 100 percent. yeah i never knew that was that really happened i thought that was just uh, oh yeah yeah everything that you guys say in that scene has been said to me for real and in, in fact i think i pulled back on the lines to make them less racist when you guys said them. <laughs> people are crazy man people are crazy so what's it's next? all it's all on the page. <laughs> what's next? Probably therapy. Sounds like right. <laughs> I think filmmaking's your therapy, man. I think getting yeah, out there, it, getting it on set, and 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 writing it and doing it is your therapy. Correct. Yeah, yeah, one hundred percent. It is. As for what's after in between, I don't know. You know, I hadn't really thought about it because it's like that. Those have mystery spot and in between have kind of been the bookends for a long time. I've been thinking about them so long. I don't even know what's beyond that um i have a couple ideas i just i don't know i definitely am gonna i think i'm definitely gonna stick to the whole try to make stuff like the whole cassavetes try to make stuff under my own power and not involve as few people as possible there's definitely gonna be strict parameters like it's gonna be a little indie thing that i do under my own power or if it's something i do with other people's money it's got to be a life-changing amount of money you know, and something that I'm super passionate about, like Children of the Corn Six. <laughs> Don't offer me Children of the Corn Six. I mean, I'll take it, but you know, but you know what I mean? Like something like that's part of the system, you know, that where it's directing can be my job, job, and I know it'll get out there. I know it's in good hands, kind of thing. No, oh, absolutely. Something that's uh, going to, be have a positive effect on your family, you know? And right. Yeah. It's got, it's got to move the needle some you know some way so no i totally understand what can you tell future filmmakers what advice would you bestow what a 19 year old going to film school wanting to wanting to make films uh to be honest i would say drop out of film school save your money and make a movie because i think that you're going to learn First of all, if you want to learn that stuff, it is all on the internet for you. Like there's so many resources now that I wish I had had. Go work on a set. Or if you're going to, if you need to stay in college, I mean, I get that too. Make college, I don't want to say your fallback, but make it 
the gas in the tank for your film career, like get a degree in business or something where you can get a job job that you can then finance your film career with. So I would say get set yourself up financially to where you can. You don't have to worry about paying your bills and then make your thing and do the best that you can, you know, do the best that you can with it and, you know, go from there. Any any last parting words? No, man, I just want to thank you for the support. I appreciate it. Like, the you know, the ongoing support, all the roles, all the training. It helps in a way that you don't realize. Are you talking about jujitsu? Yeah, about jiu-jitsu. yeah, yeah, jujitsu. Like, we'll have you back on to talk some jujitsu stuff because you because you're an OG like myself. You were there training with some some legends back in the day. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. I wish I'd I wish I'd been able to stick with it more because I'd be a freaking assassin at this point. But filmmaking was my jujitsu. You know, that's what I put all that energy into. But yeah, you know, it's like that stuff. That that getting back into it now was perfect timing because. It's so value, valuable to not only keep my health in check, but to keep my mind in check, you know, with Absolutely. all this other stuff going on. Absolutely, man. Well, thanks for being on the show. And, thanks for uh, having me. Come back anytime. All right, man. Thanks again. A big shout out to Mel for being on the show today. Make sure you check out Mystery Spot. Like I said earlier, currently available on multiple streaming platforms. The link is in the description. Make sure you check that out. Also, make sure you check me out by following me on Twitter so you can stay up to date with everything that's going on with my new graphic novel, The Gentleman's Guild. Art by E. by Canalis. Yep, E. by Canalis is doing the art. And don't forget to watch Lion Killer, my debut feature film. That's right, I made a movie. It's called Lion Killer. It stars Regina Ting Chen, who's currently on season four of Stranger Things. You can watch it at Amazon Prime, Tubi TV, Freebie, the Roku channel, or you can pop on over to the YouTube channel called V Movies. And thanks for watching this episode of Fury Cast. And don't forget to like this video, comment down below, subscribe, and yes, smash that bell for notifications. Until next week. Peace.